Why are some of the biggest names in the culture of, of the West during the 1940s, 50s and 60s, why are they linked to the CIA? How do you fight a war? You may fight it with guns, bullets, tanks, missiles, drones, or maybe even soldiers. There's strategy, there's bloodshed, homes are demolished, entire populations might vanish. But how do you win a war? With poetry. In his book, The Master and Margarita, Russian writer Mikhail Bulgakov infamously wrote, manuscripts do not burn. The line was a reference to Soviet censorship of books about how ideas ultimately cannot be destroyed even if the books that hold them are. It's a powerful statement about the immortality of ideas. But while Bulgakov was right, ideas still can be replaced or made obsolete. And that's actually the outlook the United States unwittingly adopted during the Cold War to fight the Soviets. President Truman officially announces the end of German resistance. When Nazi Germany fell in 1945, the U.S. and the Soviet Union rose as the two major world powers. And naturally, they rose in direct opposition to one another. The Cold War was, at its root, partly about competing ideas on how to govern, how to build economies. The Americans knew that weapons and proxy wars wouldn't be enough to fight the war. They had to fight the ideas that were foundational to Soviet ideology. And so came the art and the music. The CIA, for 20 years until their program was discovered were secretly promoting certain artists and intellectuals and musicians and historians and philosophers and writers in a covert way to the kind of collective cultural NATO. The Soviets early in the Cold War years, as well as communists in other countries, mocked the United States as a cultural wasteland. They would point to Soviet art cinema, literature, and dance as evidence of the cultural depth of the communist state. What, they asked, did the bastion of capitalism and individual freedom have to offer? In 1947, the Central Intelligence Agency was established. One of its tasks was, in fact, to use culture and art as a means of spreading American influence, or at the very least, thwart the influence of enemies and those who were part of the Western intellectual and cultural elite who were critical of American foreign policy, who wanted peace and a nuclear weapon-free world. But the CIA couldn't be seen as forcing it. Americans wanted to stand for freedom. That was very much the, uh, the cause, the slogan of the, uh, the US Cold War effort. The US government didn't want to be seen to be controlling American uh, artists and intellectuals. Three years later, in 1950, the CIA launched the Congress for Cultural Freedom in West Berlin as a near direct response to a series of Soviet organized workshops and meetings around the world for communists and those who were seen to be sympathizers. The enemy wasn't actually really Moscow. The real enemy for the states, I think, were the people who were not yet convinced that this was the American century, that the Pax Americana was the best way to go forward. The purpose of the Congress for Cultural Freedom was to tap into and exploit any seeds of anti-communist, anti-Stalinist thoughts that may have been swimming around American and Western European intelligentsia. The very first meeting attracted several notable writers and intellectuals like Arthur Kessler, Tennessee Williams, Bertrand Russell, John Dewey, and Irving Brown. The CIA uh, plowed millions of dollars uh, into the Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, via fake foundations. Within a few years, Congress for Cultural Freedom was running uh, arts festivals and publishing literary magazines, uh, and staging conferences uh, around the world. It also established national affiliates uh, in uh, nearly 40 countries. There was no other organization at the time that, that was comparable, except perhaps for the funding that the Soviet Union were giving to their own propaganda and psychological warfare outfits. Publications in particular were told not to publish anything that could be seen as critical of American foreign policy. Famously, the CCF promoted this, abstract expressionism, a style of art that emerged in New York City following World War II. It was the first American-born style of art that gained international prominence, and that was by design. Abstract expressionism didn't have structure. It was spontaneous. It was seen as just pure carnal expression of human instinct. 
This provided an incredible visual challenge to Soviet realist art, which in comparison was deemed as controlled and contrived. It wasn't natural human expression, but an authoritarian one. Jackson Pollock, known for his paint dripping technique, was one of the handful of artists whose work was promoted throughout the world through CIA funded exhibitions. It was difficult art, it was impressive art. It gave the impression that the United States had this um, very successful high culture, uh, which is something that many communists claimed uh, it didn't. This is something that artists wouldn't have been doing in the uh, Soviet Union, where, where socialist realism was the, the dominant cultural uh, aesthetic, and artists seemed very sort of controlled, very regimented. But here was the catch. The world, including many if not most of the American and Western European writers, artists, and thinkers who were involved had no idea that the CIA was behind the CCF, allegedly anyway. I think many more had a pretty good idea that money was coming from the CIA. There were actual CIA officers sort of working undercover, uh, helping run the Congress for Cultural Freedom. There was a small unit of people who knew, and that included some of the intellectuals who were brought in on the secret and they were the ones who were then getting their other intellectuals and artists and everybody conjoined to this but without telling them the truth. The program was exposed in 1966, 16 years after being founded through a series of articles published by the New York Times and an expose in 1967 by the far left magazine Ramparts. It was revealed that the reach of the CCF, of the CIA's cultural Cold War front, was in fact pretty far and wide. Some of the 20th century's most influential personalities, from feminist Gloria Steinem to philosopher Asaya Berlin, had been, sometimes knowingly, involved in projects that served as CIA fronts. Throughout this period, from 1950 to 1966, the CIA's involvement in the arts also creeped into film. They saw an opportunity in George Orwell, in particular. Orwell, who wrote such middle school classics as 1984 and Animal Farm, described himself as a democratic socialist and was actually pretty anti-Stalinist and anti-Soviet styled socialism, something which was unusual among leftist circles at the time. The British government uh, started this trend of uh, translating Orwell's novels like 1984 and Animal Farm and uh, distributing them to foreign audiences. It was such good work. It, it, it was so readable. It was so accessible to foreign audiences. And the CIA, I think, noticed this uh, and uh, followed the British example. His books, Animal Farm in 1984, explored themes of totalitarianism, government control, repression of free speech, and even individual identity and human relationships. And that's where the CIA turned to Hollywood. When the animated film Animal Farm was released in 1954, there was one major difference between the book and the film, the ending. In the book, the oppressed farm animals look at both the human farmers and the pigs, and they're unable to differentiate between the two. It was a metaphor for the tyranny of both capitalism and communism. The farmers were the capitalists and the pigs were the communists, but that didn't fly with the CIA. The CIA covertly provided funding for the film and produced an ending that only included the pigs, meaning no equivocation. When the book 1984 was made into a movie, the CIA again altered the ending. Instead of the protagonist succumbing to the authoritarian regime, they had him let out one last gasp of defiance. It's small, but it mattered. But the CIA's involvement in Hollywood during the Cold War didn't stop there. One of the biggest propaganda talking points of the Soviet Union was to point out the treatment of black Americans. Jim Crow was, after all, alive and well for much of the Cold War. So the CIA hired a guy, more or less. In Hollywood, the CIA had a very secret sort of um, organization that was scouting films, looking around at the films that were in production and trying to insert positive racial stereotypes. But that wasn't the only way the U.S. tried to counter the narrative of racism. Enter the Jazz Ambassadors. Much in the same way that abstract expressionism was seen to represent American individual freedom through its spontaneity, so too was jazz. In 1956, the U.S. State Department started a jazz ambassadorship project. The idea was simple. Take some of the most notable and talented American jazz musicians and send them around the world. In particular, the idea was to send them to decolonizing countries which were seen as ripe for influence, whether Soviet or American. 
Jazz was very interesting because, like abstract expressionism, it was the kind of thing that confused the Soviets. There were cultural orthodoxies in the Soviet Union and in its satellites, which, if they were broken by artists, there was immediate reaction from the Soviet authorities. Dizzy Gillespie was the first ambassador. He toured the Middle East, South Asia, and the Balkans. Gillespie's success translated to more tours from American musicians such as Louis Armstrong, Dave Brubeck, and Duke Ellington. While the program was for the U.S. government pretty straightforward, it wasn't for the musicians who were involved in it. Remember, this is happening in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. There is a civil rights movement in the United States, there is Jim Crow, and there is a lot of violence. How could they tour the world boasting the homestead of tolerance and harmony the United States was, while their kin couldn't even sit at the same lunch counters as some of their fellow Americans because of the color of their skin? They went on the tours, but they had their own protests. Gillespie refused to be briefed by the State Department before his first tour. He said he had 300 years of all the briefing he needed. Louis Armstrong actually backed out of a Soviet Union tour in 1957 in response to the events in Little Rock, Arkansas, when nine black students were prevented by the National Guard from integrating into a local high school. Okay, so I started off by saying that you win a war with poetry. So how much of a victory was the program for the Americans against the Soviets? Well, I think the CIA probably would have been very pleased with the, the results of its efforts in terms of how many Western intellectuals the Congress was able to rope into its activities and all of the, the conferences and festivals and literary magazines that came out of it. But long term, this always had the potential to sort of blow up in the CIA's face. It wasn't a victory for culture for literature or for art or for jazz or for, for any other form of cultural or artistic expression because, in my view, that needs to exist and can only really breathe if it's not locked in some kind of embrace of, by, of, of the political institutions in which, it's, in which it finds itself. It's about reacting to and against those things. It's hard to know this history coupled with all the other clandestine CIA efforts to, you know, undermine movements and governments and not feel like you can't trust anyone or anything, especially these days when social media in particular makes it almost impossible to know how much you're experiencing is organic versus how much, well, isn't. If it's being done properly, you're not going to know about it. But you kind of, there's an acoustic sometimes that's wrong. Things emerge and they seem to be very well funded and it's like, where did all this come from? Those are the things that I always look at and sort of wonder a bit. But be careful because it can make you a bit paranoid. Yeah, just a bit paranoid. Fair warning, by the way, the CIA did not approve this script before we started filming. Although I'm, I'm expecting a call sometime soon. If you guys like this video and you want to see more of Pop Americana, make sure to like, share and subscribe and we'll see you next week.